Tuesday morning. <laughs> it's Tuesday morning <laughs> in Kansas City. <clears throat> and so I want to extend a welcome to you ladies, and I hope that our time here spent will be useful to you. I'm um, prepared to talk about some things, and I'm also prepared to have you ask me questions about things as well. The first thing that I want to do is to... Um, oh, I didn't bring enough. <laughs> would, would all of you uh, take out your weapons, your, your straws, and uh, unsheath the weapon, and we'll, I'm going to show you what to do with it. <clears throat> you look suspicious. It's, it's really quite harmless. Um, this is ju- this is just <laughs> this is just a plain old drinking straw. You can whack it up into little pieces if you if you have a desire to do so, uh, but you don't have to. The purpose of the the straw is to give you a very effective way to warm your voice up. Where you're in a, a hotel and it doesn't make very much, you don't have any place to warm up. You you need to wake your voice up. You need to use. This is one of the ways that you can do it. And uh, what you do is you just put the straw in your mouth, and you start making kazoo noises. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, here's why it works. Your throat is uh, about an inch and an eighth in diameter, and the straw is just uh, centimeters in diameter. So as a result of that, the, you get a constriction of air right at, the, at your lips. And as you get that constriction, it creates what's called a positive pressure environment inside your throat. Because that's so, your vocal folds can vibrate with a great deal of uh, vigor and enthusiasm without any damage. Most people use their vocal folds for two jobs. One of them is to vibrate so that they can make a sound, and the other one is to control the exit of air out of the lungs so that if you so you won't run out of breath and you've probably experienced for yourselves what it feels like to come to the end of a phrase and feel like you're out of breath and so your throat just constricts and tightens down well in the moment that your throat constricts and tightens down it no longer is uh, able to respond to the air that's left in your lungs it sets up a resistance that's too much for the air that's left inside and as a result usually um, um, pitch will sag. You'll start to sing low to pitch or flat. But if you if you do this kind of a thing, you can create uh, a relaxation in your vocal folds that will be very memorable and very useful to you. Uh, there are some byproducts that have to do with being relaxed in your vocal folds, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But uh, first of all, I'd just like to invite you to warm up. This is a you can say you've come to this session and you're going away with something very sim- significant. So I just, I just put this straw in my mouth and I just go, and the interesting thing is that when you're warming up, you don't want to over sing, you don't want to hurt your voice, but in this positive pressure environment that we're creating by putting this straw in your lips, the vocal folds will just flap and vibrate. They lose the responsibility of being the gatekeepers for the air, the exit of the air, and therefore they just turn into a passive environment. So you can go loud, you can go soft, you can go high, you can stretch as high as you want to, you can stretch as low as you want to, and it's a way of just waking up your voice, and it it doesn't really make very much noise. This is the kind of thing that you can do in your in your uh, where are we staying? <laughs> Motel, hotel room. Uh, you can do it traveling in the car. You can do it, uh, you get into a place, you only got a few minutes to warm up, you can run into the ladies' room and uh, do something like this. And so I have stashed all over my house and in lots of the pockets of my clothes just little snippets of straws. You know, I'm a teetotaler kind of guy. And so at first I was going out down the road with one of these in my lips, you know, and then I thought, that doesn't look very good. And so then I cut it off in half, and I thought, that even looks worse for people that might know me. That's exactly. So I, now I get them about this long, and I put them down inside my lips. And the only thing I have to worry about is if I uh, swallow it. <laughs> but but take, say what? Oh, yeah. Now, go stretching yourself up into the ranges that you don't like to go into. (coughs) Go all 
the way up into the top range of your right. Just stretch. All that's happening is that you're stretching the ligament of your vocal folds. The inside of your vocal folds have some ligaments attached to them, and those ligaments are just like rubber bands, and they need to be stretched out. So as any, any athlete, before you start doing anything, you stretch. And one of the stretches that you need to do is, the, is a range stretch, a little siren, a glide, something that takes you from the bottom of your voice to the top of your voice and back down again. Okay? Along the way, can you tell that you have a couple of different qualities in your voice? How many of you have two qualities, a low and a high? How, <laughs> I heard somebody say, oh, yeah, I know that. How many of you have three qualities? Okay, that's normal. Um, either one of those options is normal. For people that have not been trained as singers, it isn't surprising to have two ranges, to, to have two qualities to the human voice, because basically there are two qualities to the human voice. But oh, as you, you sort of grow up, your the mechanism in your throat uh, stabilizes, the larynx, uh, the cartilages of the larynx get firmer, and when that happens, along about uh, post-puberty time, then the voice starts to develop the ability to transition or to mix together the qualities of that voice in the middle. So for lots of folks, there are uh, three qualities, a low quality, a middle quality, and a high quality. For many women, there are four qualities. <clears throat> uh, the middle voice is pretty wide, and so it sort of divides between a lower middle where it's in the, a mixture, but it's more related to the low voice, and there's a mixing voice that's related to the high voice, and then there's, there's the high voice. And uh, all of you have a phobia about singing in your high voice when you're, in, uh, when you're calling because you get negative feedback when that happens. And that negative feedback is sometimes deserved, and sometimes it's just not deserved. And when I say it's just not deserved, what I mean is that um, square dancers are the same as every other, other kind of people. They like what they know, and they don't like what they don't know. And they, their first reaction is to speak with, uh, to react negatively when they hear something that's different what the, than what they're used to. Now, they have reason to, to speak negatively about something that they hear that's new and is unpleasant. But um, many, many, on many occasions, the upper voice of the uh, part of the woman's voice is the sweeter, more attractive side of the voice. Now, sometimes it isn't so sweet and so attractive. Sometimes it's kind of tight and shrill, particularly if you don't know how to get into that range. So one of the things that I'd like to do today is to have you exploring different kinds of range in your voice and seeing if you can find ease in gaining access to all of that range. And then if you do, then I challenge you to sing in the range that's most effective for you. Some of you sing much lower than is normal for you. You have to work hard to get it down into the low range. And for you women, I would suggest that maybe you ought not to be doing that that you start finding the place where your voice is most optimum, and then you sing in that range. And I can guarantee you that the thing that um, dancers listen to is a shrill, edgy, tense sound. Nobody likes it. They don't like it in a man's voice. They don't like it in a woman's voice. They especially don't like it it's a woman in a woman's voice because it sounds so much like the inner voice of their mother telling them to make their bed and get up on time. And so everybody carries a sound of, uh, of a woman's voice that is irritated with them, and nobody likes that sound uh, because they, all of us, I mean, you think about, you, you can hear your mother's voice, and you can hear it in a very kind and gentle way, but you also know what she sounded like when she wanted you to do something and you weren't doing it. And so you want to avoid those kinds of sonorities in your voice if you possibly can. Sometimes the tension is not intentional. It's inadvertent because a person doesn't know how to do better. So that's what I'm hoping we can do today. So this can be a tool for you to warm your voice up. It can be very useful to you in terms of taking pressure off of your voice. And if you are a person who has a tendency to not use very much air in your singing, then this is a tool that you can use to measure. Because when you put the straw in your mouth, you have the advantage of being able to put your hand at the end of the straw and feel the stream of air coming out. So would you put the straw in your mouth 
and I want you to glide up toward the top of your voice. Put your hand in front of it, just an inch or so in front, so that you can feel the stream of air, and I want you to glide up to the top of your voice. There may be some yodeling that goes on in between there. Don't worry about that. That's just a changing of registers. But along the way, you, uh, what I want you to do is to attend to whether or not the stream of air starts to diminish when you go to the high side of your voice. Let's try it and, t and see what you get. Go ahead. Some of you are exploring that high side of your voice, and some of you just don't know what high is. Come on, go up into your squealing kind of range. That's the range that I'm looking for. I want you to explore. <coughs> now the question is, when you get up into that high side of your voice, does the air flow or does it cut off? You know, it's not because the air isn't delivering. It's because your vocal folds are resistant and stiff. So my suggestion to you is now go up into that high side of your range and start with the assumption that the air is going to remain constant. You'll, make some, you'll have to make some adjustments in your voice so that the vocal folds don't get inordinately tight. And, and so just experiment. There are other ways you can do this if you don't happen to have a straw handy. You can do a lip buzz, and what happens is that when your lips are buzzing, there's enough air to keep your lips buzzing. It's simple. If you go, all of a sudden, there isn't enough air to cause my lips to buzz anymore, and as a result of that, they won't buzz. Um, some of you have been in the sessions where I've talked about the Bernoulli principle, which is an aerodynamic law that says when air is in motion, it creates suction, and when, you, when your lips buzz, that's the law that's happening there. You go, and your lips start somewhat apart. They get drawn together because of the suction. The air builds up, blows them apart. The air passes. It blows close. And so when you get up to a high range, if you don't have air flowing, your lips won't buzz anymore. So that's another way that you can monitor, to monitor it. For some of you, just getting your lips to buzz in the first place is a bit of a trick. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but that's simply because of too much tension in your lips or not enough air flowing, either one of those things. There is a rule. That's not a rule. There's a, a research project done about 25 years ago where they took singers and non-singers and tested airflow. They discerned and learned that singers use three times as much air as non-singers. So they do that when it's loud, they do it when it's soft, they do it when it's high, they do it when it's low. It's just a standard rule that singers use more air. And somehow or another, in the process of using more air, they don't run out of air. And that's a bit of a trick, don't you think? Because most singers, I mean, you think about it, you've got a long phrase, what do you do? You take your breath and you hold your breath. You, you don't let it out very much, and that's not a good idea. The right idea is to learn how to measure your breath. So we've now touched on a couple of uh, topics. One of them is that you've got a wider range than you usually give yourself credit for, that the air needs to flow constantly through your, uh, your voice in order for it to not be tight or shrill, that, that that ease that comes as a result of your passive vocal folds will open the door to you singing in wider ranges and wider changes of dynamics than if your vocal folds are stiff. When the vocal folds get tense, you lose notes off the bottom of your voice and you lose notes off the top of your voice. And when you can get your vocal folds relaxed, you can get more of that range than you would otherwise have. <clears throat> so now I need, an ex I, I need a volunteer. Is anybody willing to be a volunteer? Come on up. Okay, Lynn. Um, I'm going to ask Lynn to do something, and I'm going to ask, after she's demonstrated, I'm going to ask you to do it, too. You might want to shut that door. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> okay, Lynn, will you say, <coughs> not that. <coughs> Gosh, now Kansas City in spring is like crazy. Yeah. I want you to just go, shaw. Shaw. But do it with vigor. Use, put some breath in it. Shaw. Well, I, that wasn't the right idea. Was, I want you to do it loud, like you're going to say, oh, Shaw. Shaw. Thank you. 
That's more like it. What I'm trying to do is to get a sufficiency of airflow so that her vocal folds will vibrate naturally. You all have heard me talk about this before, haven't you? Do I need to go back and sit up, set this up a little bit better? I better. You go ahead and sit down. Okay. I'll, I'll set this up better. If you've got a couple of pieces of paper, you all, all seen me do this before? Some of you haven't. I need, I need, I need somebody to hold the microphone. Thank you. I can do that. <clears throat> so I got a couple of pieces of paper in my pocket. The Bernoulli principle is just simply that air, that air in motion creates suction or it creates low pressure. And the faster it moves, the more low pressure it creates. So if these two pieces of paper represent my vocal folds and you don't know anything about the Bernoulli principle, you'd say that I put them together, blow between them, and they'll blow apart when in actual fact the opposite happens. Now watch. <laughs> they get drawn together, and that's the result of that low pressure thing. So when your voice, when the air is coming up out of your lungs, it channels into this opening, the slit between your vocal folds, called the glottis, and it, the, the space narrows. And as it narrows, the, vol the molecules speed up, and as they speed up, the vocal folds at some point will hit a point of uh, a threshold of efficiency and they'll be drawn closed. You don't have to muscle them closed. They'll be drawn closed. If your vocal folds are wide apart, if you get a fast enough stream, they'll still get drawn closed. Of course, our lungs have a limited capacity, so that's not the right idea. It's just that you don't have to make your vo voice vibrate. It will vibrate if you set these in motion. And if you hit the right velocity of speed, <laughs> you notice I've got these pieces of paper folded backwards, and they're still almost functioning. But if I get them at the right speed, <laughs> can't do it because they've been folded too much. They're pulled, but they'll start to vibrate. They'll vibrate. Now watch. And that's what you want to have happen with your vocal folds. Thank you. So now, when I was talking to Lynn and she was going, you could hear that there was air leaking. There was, uh, and the real answer to that question is, how does Lynn get her voice to be efficient in its activity? And if she, she, she sounds breathy, you'd think, well, there's too much breath there. The truth of the matter is there isn't enough there to draw the vocal folds to close, and so they, the air leaks out, and that creates this breathy quality. Oh, is the function of not enough airflow, not too much airflow. Isn't that interesting? So some people know that that, that sort of sound is not appropriate except in the bedroom, and so then therefore, <laughs> and, and so they will, not knowing that it's an airflow problem, they will then um, tighten up their vocal folds to make do with the air that they've got. And that's what many, many people, amateur type singers, do, is that they just hold their vocal folds a little tighter to make do with too little of airflow. Well, as soon as they hold their vocal folds in that tighter place, they can make an intense, clear sound, but they also limit their range and they limit the, the duration of their voice. There's some tension associated with it. So at any rate, if I were to go, sha, 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 you can hear the sound just start to come to be. And all that's happening is that I'm increasing the stream of breath, not the quantity of breath, the velocity of my breath. I've done this demonstration a lot of times before, and I'll ask you to do it. Bear with me if you've done it before. Just hold your hand up. Pretend that you have a child's pinwheel right on the tip of your finger. Blow on it. Make, it, make the pinwheel move slowly. I'm trying to create an environment that makes perfect sense to you. You see what your body does to get the air in motion? Now make the pinwheel go faster. See what your body does to intensify the, the breath stream? Now make it go really fast. That's what Lynn is going to do as she gets back up here now. So start with the pinwheel moving really slowly. You say, oh. Are you just in off. noise? Just oh. off. I mean, oh. Imagine that the air is moving it slowly enough so that the pinwheel moves slowly. Oh. Now make the pinwheel move faster. Oh. Make it move really fast. Oh. You hear the change in the quality of her voice. It becomes increasingly inf efficient as she gets more air moving. There's a, an underlying concern in Lynn's voice in, in her mind. She hasn't put it, voice to it yet. But the, it, the concern is, if I use that much air, I'll never make it to the end of the phrase. 
Yeah, but the truth of the matter is the most efficient place for your breath to be is on that threshold place because if the vocal folds are too lax or the breath is too insufficient, it will leak, and as it leaks, it wastes. If you tighten up your vocal folds, then it takes an inordinate amount of breath pressure to make the vocal folds start to vibrate, and you waste energy. It's overproducing your voice. Uh, and the right place is to hit that balance between passivity in your vocal folds and movement of the breath. That has to be a kind of a discovery process. And there's a point where you can move from an inefficient production to an efficient production. That point of efficiency you can hear. Now watch what happens. <clears throat> Right there. You could hear it. it. Up until that moment, there was leakage in the sound. It was, it was nice and warm and friendly, but it didn't have clarity. The point of clarity is that point of efficiency. Now, I can create that clarity by tightening up. Uh, it's clear, right? But it's also tense. Can you hear the tension in it? There's an edginess to the sound. That's the sound that square dancers don't like to hear, that edgy quality. Because it sounds like you're ticked off at them and that they're going to make a mistake as, they've, as they, they don't do their choreography correctly. That's what you don't want to get. So you can create oh, that kind of a sound and you say, all the left. And they say, yes, ma'am, and I'm on my way. Because there's, there's some clarity in that sound, but there, it's a friendly, warm, pleasant sound, inviting, but commanding at the same time. And it all has to do with the relationship between this tightness in your vocal folds, and the movement of your breath. Would each one of you try this? <clears throat> Hold your, just first make a sighing sound. Ah. <laughs> yeah, good, like, oh, it's too early in the morning <laughs> for me to be up. It's that kind of sound. Now, hold up the pinwheel. Make the pinwheel move slowly. And ma this is imaginary, right? Make the, did, you, did I have you all do this? Just you. Just you? Okay, so all of you try it. Blow on the pinwheel slow. See what your body does to make the air motion? It's not very much. Now make it move faster. See it? Now make it go fast. Make it go really fast. Your body, down here in your torso, does some things that you've already known how to do all those years that allows your breath to intensify itself. You could also play this game like b blowing out a birthday candle. Hold your, your candles burning on the tip of your finger. Hold it up two inches in front of your, and blow it out. Easy. Now move it four inches away. Blow. Blow the candle out. Move it eight inches away. Blow it out. It's, easy. it's the same sort of activity. Your body, in, in everyday kinds of ways, knows how to do that. But now the trick is that as soon as you start to energize your body, your vocal folds will have a tendency to want to energize in the same way. You have to keep them in that passive sighing place and increase the breath stream. Would you try it? First sigh. Ah, ah. That's it. Hold a steady pitch if you can. Ah. Yeah. It doesn't matter what pitch you're on. Now, imagine that the pinwheel is moving slowly. Ah. Imagine the pinwheel is moving more quickly. Ah. Now, you can hear the collectively in the room that there's more sound than there was a moment ago. Your, your vocal folds are in the same relaxed position they were, but because of the Im improved speed, there's greater suction, not enough to bring it to clarity yet, but enough so that there's more sound. Now make the pinwheel move faster. Ah. Now what you're getting is a, a perfectly clear sound that still has a, a sense of passivity in the throat. That's actually a very significant thing. Now, with that notion in mind, we're going to come back to that notion a little bit later. But, Lynn, would you come back up and do what we did a moment ago? I want you to say, sha, but on that point of efficiency. Sha. Good. Now, try to, try to leave your throat in a passive place, you know, like it's, it's sighing still, but move the stream of breath fast. Sha. It's not quite fast enough. Sha. That, that's better. Sha. Good. You notice that each time that happens, she hits this point where the tone is clear. But the way she's doing it right now, it's very easy. It has no tension associated with it. Okay, so 
Now, that's not really what I'm all about. I'm just sort of setting up the conditions for what we're going to talk about. Okay, so I want you to put your hand right here on your chest. And I want you to do that again. Shaw. Shaw. You feel vibrations underneath your hand? A little bit. Yeah, that's her, that's called her heavy voice or her chest voice. And it gets the nickname because it vibrates in your chest. That's the range that most of you feel like you have to sing in when you're, you're, when you're singing uh, square dance calls. What I'd like to ask you to do now is to, uh, to do that same thing a little higher. If instead of Shaw, I want you to say Shaw, like, hi, how are you? Shaw. Shaw. Right. Now, does it still vibrate on your hands? No. Uh, it does, too. Didn't feel it. Yeah, try it again. Shaw. There's a, where are the vibrations? Well, it moves from here to here. That's right. It moves upwards, doesn't it? Yeah. But not only does it, she feel a little bit uh, in her chest, but you're now starting to feel something on your cheekbones or in your mouth or some vibrations that are higher in your body than there used to be. Try it again to see if that's true. Shaw. There's a, a sense yeah. in the back of your throat or in your mouth or on the cheekbones or something like that. Right, right under here. Yes, ma'am. That's right. Because what's happening now is she's, she's using her mixed voice. There's a light voice, which is usually called the head voice, and it gets that name because it only vibrates in the head. And there's another heavy voice that vibrates in your chest, and then you can mix those things together. You all are going to get to try this in just a minute, but you're hearing it demonstrated out. Now, let's say that you're going to use your call voice. That's like when there are people 100 yards away or even 75 yards across the dance floor and you don't have the microphone. How do you get to them? Say, hey, you. Hey, you. That's right. Now, where does that vibrate? There. Yeah, it, it rises up, but there's still, uh, there's still a little. Just a, try it again. Hey, you. It's still a little connected yeah. to your whole body, isn't it? But it's more head than it is chest. Yeah. That's also the mixed part of her voice. And you notice that when she did that, she did so very naturally. There was no strain associated with it, but it was something you don't normally associate with singing. It's not a range you normally use for singing. It's a range that you use for particular kinds of speech. Now, the next one I call my excited voice or my hysterical voice. And that's when you're so excited that you just can't step. You can't talk low. You just have to talk up high. Anything that you're really excited? You mean like this? Well, kind of like that. I'm so pleased to be here with you today. That's another way to do it. <laughs> there was a little lie in that word because. <laughs> <laughs> no, there wasn't. Okay, so now the other one is to say um, it's your uh, hysterical voice, like as in, I just feel so frustrated that I can't talk low. You ever heard anybody say, I feel so frustrated that I can't? <laughs> no. Our, our, our body normally inflects upwards when we become more excited, either in frustration or agitation. Yeah, so can you do that? Is there anything you're feeling particularly frustrated about? I can't sleep at night. There, you see how naturally that was, and there was no strain in that. Now, can you say Shaw in that range? Shaw! No, I guess not. <laughs> yeah. Now, all of a sudden, it lost its, natural, its naturalness. So you talk about sleeping again at night. I can't sleep at night. You hear there's no strain in that. It's just, uh, except the frustration of not sleeping at night. Now, put, is there any vibration in your chest when you do that? I don't know. I'll try it. No, there is. Not, is there? Not, try it again. Just a little bit. Try it again. Higher. I, I can't sleep at night. When you got to sleep, that's that separate voice. But I felt it right here. Yeah. Right on my mm -hmm. collarbone. Yep. That's the, the action of your vocal folds, but there's a lot of activity happening up in your head, isn't there? Okay, so the trick is to find access to those ranges, some of which you haven't used for years, ever since your children left home. <laughs> Couldn't have <Yeah>. a seat. <laughs> Except when the grandchildren come back. Yeah, don't touch the... Oh, <laughs> that's a... Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, that voice that you use... Yeah, I would, you know, Richard would carry a whole lot better than Richard. I, but the, but it wasn't nearly as satisfying, was it? <laughs> the, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah. No, that's right. Women will very often use that very lyrical top of their voice because it has much, many high frequencies in it. And because it has high frequencies, it carries a long distance. Whereas low frequencies don't carry a long distance at all. They travel short distance and then they die. So 
uh, the trick is to be able to find access to those sonorities in your voice. Would all of you do just like Lynn did and start in an easy, comfortable range? It doesn't have to be ex exceedingly low, but it needs to be somewhere in the low, comfortable range. And just say, Shaw. Can you do that on that threshold of efficiency? Shaw. Yeah, so that there's no breathiness in it. It's just clear tone. Shaw. Can you feel where it vibrates in your body? Right on your sternum. It's actually your trachea under inside, but that's right behind your sternum. And so it causes a vibration that you can feel on your sternum. You can put your hand on your, on your chest and you can feel that vibration most of the time. Climb a little higher. So that's, that's the kind of intimate conversational voice that we normally use when we're not trying to project. When we, when we want to project, if I were not using a microphone and I were trying to talk to you all, I would use this kind of a voice. This is my, <laughs> this is my lecture voice. No, this, this is my elevated conversation voice. So would you say, Shaw? Shaw. That actually sounds like the normal place for most of you. It seems to be the most easily produced. Now go into the place like you are going to call somebody. Your call voice. Shaw! Shaw. Try it again. And try to remember to have it be that point of breath efficiency, not pressing into that range. Shaw! Shaw! That's right. Now, you can still feel that there's a little connection in your body, but it's increasingly become more and more head-related. And now go to the top of your voice, your hysterical or your excited voice. Shaw! Yeah, you know how to find that voice. Good. Okay, so what you've actually experienced are the four ranges that kind of overlap each other. You can take that top voice and glide it down, if you will, to the, the upper voice. You know, so you get the upper mixed voice and the top voice. Glide down uh, through where you start at the top, glide to that, and then glide back up again. Go. Sha! If you went through that range smoothly, then you have access to those ranges. If in the process of going through those ranges your voice yodeled, that means that the, the junction between those two ranges is not as secure as it needs to be, and it will be a little scary for you when you're singing. You all know what it feels like when you hit a range in your voice and you can't tell if the voice is going to go up this way or down that way and it kind of uh, waffles back and forth. That's a transition point that isn't very secure yet. And the trick is to figure them, find them, and then secure them so that you can have access to them as you move through. Usually for women, this next transition is the most difficult. And that is the upper middle voice to the lower middle voice. So will you try that? First, this is your call voice into your elevated conversation voice. So, so try that. Well. Well done. I didn't hear any yodeling at all. Nice job. Now, the, the elevated conversation to the bottom. Shaw. You notice that in the process, we're not really hitting real pitches. We're just hitting ranges. And that's okay. The, the tool that makes that gliding possible is uh, the ligament that is on the inside edge of your vocal folds. It's just like a rubber band, and it stretches. As it stretches, pitch goes up. The vocal folds thin, there's less vibrating mass, the pitch goes up. As it uh, shorten, or, you know, gets shorter, the vocal folds get thicker, and as they get thicker, the pitch is heavier. There's more ma vibrating mass. And it's really as simple as that. Incidentally, in case you're wondering, your vocal folds are really no bigger, no longer than the fingernail on your little finger from the, the exposed part of your fingernail. That's the size of your vocal folds. It's really small, and it's really narrow. It's about as thick as your fingernail, maybe, maybe twice as thick as your fingernail, the vocal fold is. So you're talking about two little folds of flesh that in their vibration patterns make noises that can, can fill a room and project. It's really quite a miraculous thing. But because they're so small, they can also hurt, you know, if you don't treat them well. And that's one of the reasons why if you want longevity in your singing, both in terms of today and tomorrow and next month and next year, but also this moment, the next moment, and through the three hours that the dance lasts, 
If you want longevity in your voice, the single most important thing you can do is to make sure that you have a stream of air, that you keep your voice active as the result of moving air. That's really important for you. Um, the next thing that you want to be able to do is to coax your voice into a more passive place. So you're not, I'm not asking for you to start to sing with this kind of gentility in your voice. I really want you to be at this level of gentility, and all that was was an increase in breath energy. This is, the, this is unenergized, and this is energized, and you hear that, that there's something changes in the sonority. It not only becomes clear, but it starts to take on characteristics of um, uh, command, command form, but it's not tight in its production. It's loose in its production, and that's really important, particularly for women callers. You want to have command in your voice, but you want to do it in a friendly kind of a way. You don't want to be a domineering kind of voice. And that, that's, again, finding that point of efficiency. There is another element that women will want to put into their voices to give it a sense of command in whatever range that you sing. And I call that primal sound. How many of you heard, have heard of me talk about primal sound before? I don't want to duplicate myself. Primal sound it gets its name from the sound that a newborn baby makes. You have all, if you've all had children, you know that you cannot not hear a newborn baby cry. It's just impossible. You could be at the other end of the house and you could hear that baby's crying voice. Little bitty creature, doesn't have very much lung capacity, and boy, can you hear that baby. Women can hear it better than men. No, that's right. Well, what, hap what happens, believe it or not, the, the vocal tract of a newborn baby is exactly the same dimension as the inner ear of a, of a woman's ear. And so those, tone, those tones are exactly tuned to not let you not hear. So if you blamed your husband for sleeping through, it's because his ears are, are at a different uh, dimension and he doesn't really hear it with the same degree of intensity that you do. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so men don't respond well to the sound. They respond really well to an elbow. <laughs> so my point is that that sound that a newborn baby makes is, uh, is just God-given. They come making that sound. It's a matter of survival. You all came with that primal quality in your voice. And all of you, if you had more than one child, knows what it, know what it's like when you get two or three or four children all using their primal voices in the same room at once. It is just deafening. It's impossible to hear yourself think. And so, as a mother, you start saying, and your teachers start saying, and everybody starts saying to little children, use your inside voice. Don't use your outside voice. Use your inside voice. And children become accustomed to understanding that their outside voice is not polite. It's rude, and it's uh, offensive. And so, most people learn how to filter that primal sound out of their voice. You all remember when you were going through school that there were certain people in your classes that just never got it, that were loud and noisy all the time, that didn't know how to mute their voices, and they were sort of in a, a social embarrassment because they were just so loud all the time. They came from families that quarreled. They came from families that were loud and boisterous, and they just didn't know how to be quiet. Well, they, they suffered the, the social stigma of not learning how to mute their voices. But then they got older, and boy, they could really sing because they hadn't learned to take that quality out of their voices. So I'm going to show you something right now. Right now, all this time, I've been talking with primal sound in my voice, and now I just took it out. Do you hear the difference in the sound? This is the sound that you say when you're wanting to be mild and non-aggressive. And when you want somebody to really hear what you have to say, you put primal sound back into it. And you do it without ever really realizing you do it. You, can you hear the difference in the sound when I speak? This is the primal sound, and this is not the primal sound, and this something goes away. And it becomes gentle and non-assertive. Which voice do you think you want to use when you're calling? <laughs> you want that primal sound for sure. But the interesting thing is that that primal sound is an acoustical phenomenon. It is not a physical, you know, it's not, you don't tighten up your vocal folds to create it. I'm going to pass the microphone around one by one, and uh, now I'm not using it because I'm inviting you. And then I'm going to ask you to put primal sound in your voice. I'm going to start with you, Betsy. Would you count to five not using primal sound? One, two, three, four, five. 
One, two, three, four, five. Betsy used another alternative from primal sound. She just she just spoke louder, right? And you could hear that there was a, there got to be a little bit of a strain on the voice. And so this is actually something that you can do very quietly. Here's primal. Here's it without primal sound, and here it is with primal sound. Can you hear the difference at all? Here's primal sound, and here is not. There's something that tunes up in your throat that captures that sound that makes it possible even a very quiet range. So that uh, a mother who learns how to do this will say, go clean your room, eat your peas. And the person will say, I better do it because it's important. So count to five with primal sound. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. It's not that hard. You don't know what you ex- you did exactly, but it's not that hard. With, with, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two. One doesn't have it. One, two, three, four, five. How did you do that? I'm not sure. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. It's not easy to concentrate. That's, uh, you're one of those women who has not put that in her voice for quite a long time because you put it in and it was only partially present. Uh, it was still, you, you're a woman who has uh, cultivated a gentility of delivery in dealing with people. Uh, and and so to put it back in f- sometimes is like a social taboo. Like, I, oh, I, I, I just uh, I don't want people to think of me as being aggressive. Joan Rivers doesn't know how to turn it off. <laughs> there are some sensations that happen, aren't there? When I felt it in my cheek. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, there, it has some unique vibratory sensations. But what you were feeling were the byproducts of something that was actually tuned up in your throat. Uh, and, and, uh, and that's one of the dilemmas when you take voice lessons. The voice teacher says, always put it into the mask. Make it vibrate in the bones of the face. Well, that's a byproduct. And so trying to get a byproduct to happen sometimes leads people to make uh, mistakes and uh, uh, mistrain their voices in the process. But when the voice is well-trained, the vibrations will be in the mask of the face. It has to do with the releasing of control here in your throat. That I'm, I'm not really trying to talk to you the details about it. I'm just trying to set up the conditions so that you can make some discoveries. Okay, would you try it, Lynn? Yeah. With? One, two, three, four, five. Take it out. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Same breath energy, but no primal sound. One, two, three, four, five. You, you, you got it, didn't you? You figured yes. out what you were doing. Yes. Okay. Try it. With. With. One, two, three, four, five. You were a school teacher, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Does that have it in or out? What would all of you say? Out. 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 Right. Well, I'm not there. One, two, three, four, five. Right on. You know what you did? No. <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> okay, yeah. With? Uh, let us guess. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, no. 
One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Take it out when you're trying to be gentle and kind toward people. Um, when you're being intimate, like with a dog or with an animal or with a small child, or while you're trying to soothe somebody who is. The first was with the eight year old, the second was with the three year old. <laughs> That's right. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Mm-hmm. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Depends on how mad I would be. Yeah, but you don't want to no, but I mean, I'm just kidding. Yeah. So, so go ahead and put that okay. Clarity. Okay. That's right. <laughs> True. One, two, three, four, five. 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 Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf. Very well done, all of you. Once you got the hang of it, once you got the hang of it, it wasn't hard to accomplish. But those associations of that primal sound are going to give you the way that you make the dancers hear you on the floor without feeling shrill. There's no shrillness associated with this. It does have upper frequency in it, even though the pitch that I'm speaking right now is relatively low. Because of the primal sound, it has high frequency in it. That creates uh, energy that, that travels directionally and penetrates into a person's ear and makes them, it arrests their attention and causes them to listen. You, this kind of sound is distinctive from this kind of a sound. This kind of a sound is not friendly. This kind of a sound is very friendly, very easy, but very uh, arresting. And so learning to tune that quality into your voice and trusting that it will be there is the right solution for you if you're trying to find a way to be more uh, controlling on the floor, to get people to listen to you more. And incidentally, primal sound is not associated with any particular pitch. Here I'm speaking in a low voice, and I can put it into a higher voice, and I still have that primal quality, and I can put it up into this range, and it still has primal quality to it. 
it doesn't have anything to do with the pitch that you're doing. It has to do with something subtle that you do in your throat to uh, permit it to happen. And I don't think it would be even sensible for me to try to describe what it is that you'd be doing it, because you already know how to do it. You don't need instruction. You just need permission to do that. So primal sound is really significant for women callers. Men's callers, for some reason, don't really care about it. Some of the men that you listen to have real pretty voices. They're melodious, mellifluous kind of voices that are that sort of put people at ease. Oh, yeah, intoxicating. I'm not going to ask which one. Yeah. I am. Yeah, and that can be not necessarily a good thing. Um, but then there are others who do have this primal sound, and they are the ones, they may not have the most beautiful voices, but they're also the ones that you enjoy dancing to because there just seems to be a purpose to what they have to say. So the, so far what we've talked about today has been that you need to get more airflow into your into your voice than you normally use. You could almost take it to the bank that you need to use 30% more airflow than you think that you should. Or you can do this little pinwheel thing and hit it uh, to the point where your voice turns into that efficient place. And when you get to that place, you'll know because the sound will turn clear. So you want to find a passive way to keep your vocal folds at, at, at rest, you know, so that they're not tense. Then you want to find primal sound. And then you want to have the opportunity to explore a wide range. We've touched on those several things. I honestly think those are the significant things for you ladies having to do with your voice in calling. You need to learn how to inflect your voices into wider ranges without... If, um, uh, increasing the tension level in your voice. You need to be able to keep the airflow through so that there isn't um, tension or um, shrillness in the tone. And in, at, in the absence of that shrillness, you need to find the primal quality, which is um, borrowed from um, the world of painting, a terminology called chiaroscuro, which means bright and dark simultaneously. So you can hear in my speaking voice that there's depth in my voice, but the characteristic that probably stands out the most is that that uh, high frequency, which you wouldn't identify as a high frequency, except that it's very penetrating. It, it uh, travels quickly and easily and makes you want to listen to it. And that's not because of any interest that I have. It's just because of that sonority that we all listen to. You listen to people that really want to make their point, who really have something important to say. They always put primal sound in their voice. Always. When they're trying to con you, when they're trying to pretend to say something important, they almost always talk like this. So whenever I hear somebody say, yeah, trust me, I put my hand on my wallet and say, I'm not going to trust that person at all. But if somebody says, you need to believe me when I say this, I'll be more inclined to hear it. It's the primal element. Okay, so how are we doing on time? I don't want to have us go too long. Got a few extra minutes. So, are there questions that you'd like to ask? How do you like, make your voice stay? Okay. With, my name's Elaine. I'm from South Dakota. Elaine Peacock from South Dakota. And, we, you know, like, you're going along and you're doing just fine. And then you know you make a mistake, but you just want to keep your voice the same so you can figure it out. And, and, and you, the dancers don't know that you messed up. Are you talking about choreography? Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, to keep your voice, the level, same level, commanding level, while you figure it out where you are. That actually has more to do with a person's personality and their response to stress, you know, than anything else. Um, most of us, when we make a mistake, we feel guilty about our mistake, we feel stupid, and we reveal that with our body language, we reveal it with our inability to think, we become self-conscious, and we freeze. But the best thing to do, the best thing to do is to just be in the moment. Just don't lose any sleep over it. Just say, whoops, and I'm going to solve it, and here we go, and we solve it. And wasn't that a fun way home? <laughs> Never went home that way before, did you? 
and and everybody gets a good laugh out of it. And the, yeah, um, humor is one of those easy solutions to that problem. But <laughs> what was that? I said this is potluck tip. Oh, I hadn't heard that one before. Okay, other questions that might arise. Yeah, hold on. Is that just for me, this concept with the primal sound, is it, it has to do with protection, but not it only. Does. It does. I just tried because I know that a uh, call a friend of mine lacks that, and I tried to find a way to how to explain it to her. And so your question is how, how else to explain it? Well, it is primarily that. It is pri primarily projection. Your voice has a way of tuning itself to capture high frequencies. The Italians call this sonority that's in my voice squillo. <laughs> yeah, it's a very high frequency sonority. In my case, it's up around the range. I speak at about 100 hertz. A um, uh, that means 100 vibrations per second, 110 vibrations per second. But uh, in the spoken tone, there are overtones, and they, they cascade upwards at intervals uh, of multiples of that basic pitch. And along the way, there are frequencies that are um, tuned into my resonance track right around 25 to 2,800 hertz, meaning 2,800 cycles per second. And um, this fundamental frequency that I'm speaking excites energy up in those ranges. And if I have a chamber in my throat that captures that, then that, fr that frequency will get boosted up. And that, uh, that frequency up there is really high. And what makes your voice really beautiful and mellow is the distance between the fundamental frequency and the highest overtones that are audible. And the wider that range is, the more lush or luxurious the voice is. And the more narrow that range is, the more shrill or... Um, shallow the voice is. That's probably more information than you really wanted to know. Sorry about that. I just <laughs> try to find an explanation. But it's those upper frequencies that are uh, um, overtones as a result of the bass pitch that you make. And you tune your voice in such a way to capture them. Would you like to know how you tune your voice? Yes. 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 What if I don't want to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> only, because, <laughs> only, only because I don't want to confuse you. But they're basically... Uh, in your in your vocal tract, there is a narrowing that happens as you as the sound leaves your larynx. The, you know, everybody know what an epiglottis is? That thing that's supposed to come down and keep you from choking. Well, it sits it sits at a kind of an angle, a tilted angle in the throat. And as the sound comes out out of the larynx, it goes into a, a narrowing chamber, a narrowing tube, before it passes into your mouth. And then the the percentage of narrowness compared to the amount of opening there is right above that narrow chamber is the trigger that makes that possible. So, see, I, I knew you wouldn't care to know about this, but it has, it has to do with the, the way you tune your vocal tract to capture those sonorities. And there's a natural narrowing. And then if you, in the space just at the base of your tongue, if there's more space there, all of a sudden, you'll get that ringing quality. Singers call that ring. We, I'm calling it primal sound. But it happens quite spontaneously as a result of something that's done there. You, you've all heard singers talk about singing with an open throat. It's not really that's a misnomer. Your throat can only be as, op as wide open as it can be. But uh, right at that particular place, right at the base of your tongue, if you can let that space be broader, then all of a sudden, there's going to be that... that uh, consequent primal quality. But you all know how to do that without me explaining it because you were all born with it. Diana Wagner, Topeka, Kansas. Because I haven't switched to computer yet, I'm locked into the key that the record is. Um, I'm a natural soprano having to sing a full octave lower. I find the lower notes easier than the upper notes of that lower octave and I start sounding like I'm in a falsetto voice at the upper notes of that lower octave. The transitions that you're dealing with are the ones that we talked about right at the beginning of this hour. And for 
many women, they will have their low voice and they will have their high voice and they don't match very well. That may be what you're just describing, is that as you go up into the high range, it's a little too high to keep in your low voice, and so it flips over into your soprano voice. But you notice that as we were working today, there were gradations of that. You could go from the low part of your voice to the kind of low part of your voice to the kind of high part of your voice, and those transitions can be done very, very smoothly. If you get into that so-called mixed voice, the transition from low to high in the middle is, can be done very, very smoothly, whereas a woman who doesn't avail herself of that mixed voice will have herself arrive at a, at a middle point and then have to flip into a, a voice that sounds disconnected and shrill by comparison to the, to the huskier chesting voice. So the solution to that would be to cultivate that mixed voice, that calling voice that we were talking about. So instead of going, ah, and it goes over into that sort of uh, weak sound, you go, ah, ah, there's my calling voice, and I can get there, and it, I can stay there for quite a long time. It doesn't really hurt. It's no different than your automobile that has a first gear, a second gear, a third gear, and then an overdrive. If you're lucky enough to have an overdrive, then the overdrive is like the head voice. It just kind of toodles along, but it doesn't have a whole lot of power in it. If the head voice is used properly, it can be very sweet. It can be very encouraging. It's the kind of sound that you can create like a flute that, for effect, uh, can be very, very attractive. Um, I, wouldn't, I would try to encourage you not to stay away from it, just to cultivate it. But the real solution for you all is to cultivate that mixing voice. Then you felt it. Each one of you felt it as we tried it. You found that you could glide between those ranges. So when you're driving in the car, one of the things that you, on your way to the call the dance, take your little straw and go, mm -hmm, that's the range that you're trying to get a hold of. And along the way, you can really startle yourselves. If you start with the, your voice and glide slow, mm -hmm, now that doesn't sound very interesting, but watch what happens when I finally open my mouth and reintroduce the normal human resonance. The straw eliminates human resonance. It sounds like a kazoo. It just doesn't sound very interesting at all. But if I go, see what happens as soon as I open my mouth and reintroduce the human resonance? It doesn't sound puny at all. It doesn't sound weak at all. It sounds healthy. If I go, that's the lower middle part of my voice. It just uh, turns back into a human voice again as soon as you reintroduce all of the resonance factors in your voice. You can do that same game with yourselves. You can glide into a range that says, oh, this is going to sound shrill, and you'll open your mouth, and it'll be sweet and strong, and you'll be so surprised. Yeah. Marie Gladson from Cedar Park, Texas. So are you saying that if... I've, I've always used computers, so I have never used a record um, and that pitch. I have always brought it up to where I feel comfortable. But are you saying that any record, most records are, are made by men, and they have it way down low? I will not use it that way. Are you saying we can use our voice to go down and or complement these uh, records in the pitch that they are at? Is, is that what I'm understanding from you? I want to make sure that I say my, make myself uh, appropriately clear. Everybody has a boundary on their voice. There's a bottom boundary and there's a top boundary. Most of the time that, that boundary is wider than we give ourselves credit for having, but still there's a top and a bottom for every voice. And there's an optimal range for every voice. Uh, that optimal range can, bro can broaden as you develop it, but there's always a place where you're more easily produced than other places. Uh, the singer that really expands her range all the way out will have the ability to go down low at ease um, and move high at ease. In your case, you'd probably be more comfortable in the middle of your voice, in that middle range, and therefore you'll want to modulate those songs upwards into that middle range. With the computer, can you do it without... Uh, Increasing the speed. See, that's such a terrific. That's a terrific thing to have. There are moments in time, of course, where you would like to get that really husky, low, 
uh, sound, and you want to cultivate it so that you can have access to it. But you should not feel held hostage by the need to be in that range. I want to give you permission to sing in the range that you want to, but to not, but also to empower you to explore both the bottom and the top sub part of your voice so that you can have a variety of colors, a variety of uh, sonorities that are available to you. It means something. Um, I, can't, I'm, I, I can't think of anything that I can say right That's a commercial that hasn't made it out where I live yet. No, but yeah, that one I've heard. Yeah, but but having this ability, and having this ability, and having that ability, and having that ability are all very attractive. And so, if you want to be able to sing high, sing high. If you want to sing in that range, sing in that range. If you want to sing in that range, sing in that range. You want to sing in that range, sing in that range. Just get used to doing it. And that will stretch you beyond the boundaries of where you've allowed yourselves to sort of be pigeonholed. Don't be pigeonholed. Allow yourselves to find the range that will allow you to sing the most attractively and the way, the place that you feel the best. Mary Castleberry from Joplin, Missouri. I find that I, I'm also a soprano in choir, so I do have that capability of singing high, but people, they can't always understand calls high for one thing. And they don't, some people have hear, high frequency hearing loss or it, it does irritate their ears. But I can do most of my calling, most of my singing in a lower range. And there's a few things that I can go up and loft it up, not during the calling part, during their promenade or their right and left grand. And they enjoy it if it's not something they have to understand. That's a good observation. I will also point out to you that. When people have upper frequency uh, hear pitch loss, the, the range of a human voice is well within the range even after they lose their upper hearing loss. Uh, the, the highest uh, frequency that a, a woman would sing at it, if she were an operatic singer would be about 1,000 hertz. And usually the hearing loss is from 15,000 down to about 7,000. That, that, that hearing loss doesn't truly affect that, those upper frequencies that a woman would sing where a woman gets in trouble is that she has to be not, she has to make sure she's not tense because if in the process of being up in that upper range she gets tense and then her vowels no longer make sense you can't distinguish them one from the other and pretty soon people get frustrated and don't listen anymore sometimes singers who sing too much don't pay attention to the words the words are a combination of vowels and consonants and in english there are lots and lots of consonants. In German, there are lots and lots of consonants. You do an analysis, and I've done this on several occasions, in the English language and in the German language. There, you, know, you take all the sonorities in a sentence, and it's about 70% consonants, 30% vowels. You take Italian, it's about 60% vowels and 40% consonants, which is why everybody likes to sing in Italian, because you don't have consonants to get in the way. There have to be strategies to include all of the consonants or people can't hear you. They can't understand you. And if you're singing vowels, is what singers are taught to do, then all of a sudden you can't understand it because the, the real definers of the words are those consonants that break the sounds up and make them into words. And if they're not words, then nobody's going to understand you. So if there's a tendency uh, when sopranos go up high to not attend to the consonants. They still have to be there. Lynn Nelson, Kansas City. In the session that you did yesterday, you showed us some breathing exercises. And, and, how do I want to, would doing those breathing exercises combined with what you were showing us help us to, to learn to relax the vocal folds? Absolutely. We ran out of time. I did some exercises in the session first day, first thing yesterday, having to do with being able to not run out of breath. You remember I was saying to you, Lynn was really worried when she was trying to get that airflow that she was going to run out of breath. But there were some strategies that I showed yesterday. We won't have time to talk about them in this session, but you can get the, the tape if you want to, or you can talk to Lynn about them. There were two strategies that I showed that would help keep the breath flowing over an extended period of time. And that, that we, as we were practicing it, 
we found that some people could go, what was it, 18 seconds was the phrase. We sang, um, my body lies over the ocean, and we did it without taking any breath for four phrases, and that turned out to be 18 seconds in length. Not everybody made it, but most did. Did you? Yeah, yeah see, see, Lynn was, never realized that she had 18 seconds worth of breath. I yeah, but you were comfortable up through 12 or 13 seconds, and the, and the dilemma is, not, not a dilemma, it's a, uh, it's a good thing, in singing calls, you never go longer than six seconds. Maybe at the outside you'll have a double phrase that will go eight seconds in duration. So if you have 13, 14, 15 seconds worth of uh, capacity, you never have to worry about running out of breath. When you do run out of breath, it's because you've given your breath away. You've either constricted it or blown it away, sung below that effort, that level of, of efficiency, gotten your throat really tight, and those kind of characteristics will cause you to be inefficient. So obviously, gaining access to a wider range will give you more confidence. Giving, gaining access to longer phrases will give you confidence. You will have capacities that you didn't uh, explore before. And that's what my encouragement is, to explore those things, to don't be held hostage by the boundaries that have held you in the past, but expand your horizons, expand, look for songs that, that take you into a range. You've got some principles, go practice them. Treat them like they were toys. I say to my voice students, okay, you got a new toy, go play with it. Go see how many things, how many games you can play with this new toy. The new toys that you have are primal sound, breath, uh, that threshold concept, the, the variety of ranges that you can sing in. Three new toys, go play with them and find out what you can make out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you.